Hi. All right, you can stop messaging me. I'll do a video on this thing. Physicists think they've found a way to harness energy from the Earth's rotation, and it might just be crazy enough to work. Attempt to harness energy from the Earth's rotation. Researchers disprove their own work by producing power from the Earth's rotation. Experiment generates current from the Earth's magnetic field. Don't expect limitless free energy anytime soon, however. Yeah, you think? This is in the IEEE spectrum. Anyway, Let's take a look at the research paper, and is this BS or not? So here's the paper in question, which I'll link in down below, and these are legit uh, researchers, I believe, and this is a legit paper. It's not, it's you know, not published in some quack uh, journal or anything like that, right? But it's made all the rounds. Everyone's talking about it, and a lot of people are saying, yeah, this looks legit. So let's take a look at it, shall we? We won't go into the deep uh, physics of it because that's not my area. I'm sure there's other channels that will uh, cover that. So yeah, I won't go into that, but we'll look into the practicality side of this from an electronics engineering point of view. Now, ordinarily, you should not be able to induce a current into a wire um, with the Earth's magnetic field because uh, the Earth's magnetic field doesn't rotate in relation or doesn't move in relation to the wire. So, uh, yeah, you can't just have the wire sitting there and the Earth's rotation is not cutting it. There is no induction in that wire. That's just not possible. And this has been known for hundreds of years, but uh, only in, I think, fairly recent times they've discovered that the Earth's magnetic field also has a dipole and technically that does move in relation to a static wire but it's always been oh you can't induce that into a wire so what they've done here is they've gone well you can actually do it with not a solid wire but you can do it with a cylinder and I won't go into the physics of that because as I said that's not my area but yeah anyway they're using a cylinder like a static cylinder just sitting there on the bench and I'll show you a photo the experimental photo is not in the uh, paper but this uh, photo it's in the IEEE uh, Spectra one I'll link this in down below this actually uh, comes from uh, Christopher F um, Chibe, Chiber um, who is the leading uh, researcher um, the leading name on the uh, paper here and he's from uh, Princeton University so this is the experimental setup they've got here and it's actually a reasonably simple setup which technically anyone can do as long as you've got uh, decent precision meters. These are actually uh, Gossen uh, 30Ms. Now these are actually discontinued but this is basically the world's only uh, six and a half digit handheld multimeter. I don't know if anyone else makes a six and a half digit handheld leave it in the comments down below but uh, Gossen were the only ones that made it and it's discontinued but of course you can use any you know a, a high end high count uh, multimeter to do this because we're talking about very small currents and voltages um, as as you'll see but anyway yeah they've got three multimeters here and here is their um, hollow tube it's made of uh, some material uh, hollow manganese zinc uh, manganese zinc ferrite cylinder here okay and they've got some uh, temperature probes um, on there as well which we'll uh, discuss but they've basically got it on this uh, rotational thing so they can get the angle of it and rotate and they've moved it in different locations and they've got uh, you know shield in it's obviously down in the basement or something like that right so they're trying to eliminate all the like environmental uh, variables and you can go read the full paper I haven't read the full paper but we don't have to so yeah, this is not some uh, crackpot uh, free energy experiment. These are legit researchers. Apparently they've done this before and they're disproving their own previous research. And they say, no, now it actually is possible to get a minute amount of uh, power out of a static coil from the Earth's rotating dipole. And if you have a look at the uh, figures, they've abstracted uh, here, and you can see that they're actually, um, the EMFs that they're getting from this, okay, microvolts here, right? And these are the various angles or whatnot, and we won't go into the details, but yeah, basically they're generating in the order of microvolts, and also uh, the current is generating in the order of nano amps, okay? So let's assume in that you've got 10 microvolts and 10 nano amps. Mm. Get the confuser out. Oh, it's back to front. Sorry, but that's 100 times 10 to the minus 15. That's not pico watts. That's femto watts. 100 femto watts. 0.1 pico watts. When when we're not even in nanowatt territory. Seriously, I could fart on the other side of the room and I'm going to generate more than uh, 0.1 picowatts in anything. This is ridiculous. So when you're talking about these sort of insanely low voltages and currents here, you start thinking, ah, 
thermal EMF, right? This is why you can get tellurium copper uh, contacts, right? They're special low EMF connectors. And when you're doing this sort of extremely low voltage and current uh, measurements, then you have to take into account the thermocouple effect, the, the two dissimilar, when you uh, join two dissimilar metals, i.e. when you've got your crocodile clip here, like you can see a crocodile clip attached, which is going to be a particular type of metal. It's attached to another type of metal, which in this case is a manganese zinc ferrite um, cylinder here. Um, two dissimilar metals, you can get a voltage uh, gradient across those and it's called thermal EMF and this is well known in the low or, you know the ultra low power electronics uh, field which is why you can buy specific tellurium copper uh, contacts which are low thermal EMF connectors and they don't say anything about um, like low thermal EMF connectors here like, like they don't say anything about the connections but they do actually take this into account. So if you search for EMF, uh, it shows up like 56 uh, times, right? And the um, and they're predicting the EMF generating for conducting ferrite uh, shells and all sorts of things, right? So they're, they're to really taking this into account. We won't go into the details, but they reckon that they've actually nailed this. And uh, it's the obvious reason that would uh, cause, you know, data, like, you know, errors like this. Um, and they've really gone to town to take that into account. And, you know, we expect our experiment to generate somewhat higher EMF. EMF uh, values at site B than in our primary laboratory. So they tested this in multiple locations. This is observed, but the size of one sigma error bars for EMF measurements, right? And so uh, operating in warmer environments, um, you know, so they're taking all of this into account and they're using uh, two of the Gossen meters there to actually measure um, the, uh, they've got thermocouples on there to measure the temperature differentials and all sorts of things, right? So they're really taking that into account and right in the abstract here because they want to nail it on the head because that's everyone's first question controlling for thermoelectric and other uh, potentially uh, confounding effects including uh, 50 slash 60 in uh, the US and RF uh, background we show that the small demonstration sy system continuates a DC voltage and current of the low predicted magnitude so they've you know They've taken EMF into account, and I'm not going to go into every detail of the paper and try and find holes in their argument, okay? I am going to actually um, assume, and like, it, it looks like they've done a fairly good job here. So I am actually going to assume that what they've done here is a is they're actually getting a real induced uh, current and voltage on this thing um, with a, a fixed coil in a fixed location due to the Earth's dipole. I'm going to assume that this is actually legit and they are getting legit results. Of course, this is subject to other people confirming it. And yes, technically I could go and do it, but oh my God, it, you know, it, it takes months to do something like this uh, properly. So yeah, I don't have the time or motivation to verify, but I'm sure other people will now try and verify this. So in the IEEE article here, they talk about like, you know, Faraday's original experiments and stuff like that, and how it was generally assumed that, yeah, it's not really possible, but so they actually achieved 17 microvolts and 25 uh, nanoamps um, in, 2016 but not everyone was convinced from their uh, 2016 research so they've done this again and um, yeah apparently they've done it more better uh, and uh, yeah they've got what they think is now a completely convincing uh, result so let's just assume I, I, I'm going to take it on face value that they have actually legitimately uh, got something here and these voltages and currents are due to the uh, you know the moving dipole of the Earth's magnetic field, but what does that mean in practice? Is it scalable? And to the credit of the research team, they do actually admit the amount of power being generated is extremely low, far too low to be useful. Chiba says, assuming uh, their work is correct, it remains unclear is, is, is it scalable to higher voltages or power? That remains to be demonstrated and it might not be possible or practical. Hopefully other groups can validate these findings or not. If they do get validated, next question is, can we scale it? One way to scale it up is to reduce the cylinder's diameter. The researchers note in doing so, more tubes can be placed together to amplify the generated voltage. We'll get into this in a minute. It is far too early to think about this as a future energy generation source, you think? But it's hard not to be intrigued and excited by the possibilities here. This is where I go, yeah, nah, okay? This is not going to scale. This is not going to be a thing. And let's just look at why. 
And they say it here, right? Higher voltages or power, okay? Because not only, like, the the power is one thing, right? We're already down in the hundreds of femtoamp region. We're not even picoamps, right? Even if you had nanoamps, you still can't do much with that. We're not even getting nanoamps. We're orders and orders of magnitude away from um, where you want to be to have any useful uh, power at all. But the other thing, is the voltage, right? If we're talking in the order of like tens of microvolts, okay, this is <laughs> three orders of magnitude, three orders of magnitude less than what you need for the best energy harvesting chip. So if you want to harvest this energy and, you know, store it, you might be able to, you know, harvest it over a day or a week or whatever, store it, then you might be able to do use for something useful for it. Can you do that with microvolts? Well, no, I'm afraid you can't. Let's have a look at some of the best energy harvesting chips on the market. Here's a TIBQ uh, 25570A, okay, and it's designed to extract microwatts, uh, milliwatts, right, of um, energy, not nanowatts, not <laughs> picowatts, all right, and the startup voltage to get these things actually working and kicking over, 600 millivolts, and then it can drop as low as 100 millivolts to keep it going, but you can't even start this thing up unless you've got hundreds of millivolts of this particular chip. But there are better ones than that. This Ashai Kasai one, right, the AP4473, uh, it has a startup voltage of 15 millivolts. That's damn impressive, right? That's what that's the voltage you need just to start up. It, the, you know, one of the best, lowest uh, voltage startup energy harvesting uh, chips on the market. But that is still almost three orders of magnitude bigger than what this thing can actually generate. And you, you have to remember, right? They've actually got this like big 30 centimeter long tube here. So you've got this, you know, reasonably big, like it's a foot long. That's what she said. And uh, yeah, so you've got this giant cylinder here. Okay, and you can generate your, uh, you know, your 10 microvolts, your 20 microvolts or whatever. But, but you need millivolts, not microvolts. So you're gonna have to stack like a thousand of these in series, a thousand of them, before you can get the required startup voltage to start up one of the world's best energy harvesting uh, chips. So uh, it's, yeah, nah, right? <laughs> yeah, technically it's possible. Technically you can do this. In practice, it's just pointless. So let's take, for example, one of the lowest power devices that you can possibly get. This is my Casio watch here this is my current uh, daily driver sorry i flipped my image but this has a 10 year battery life from a coin cell battery okay so let's go and take a look at a typical lithium coin cell battery the classic cr2032 here it's got a nominal current capacity of 245 milliamp hours there or no, I don't want AI. 735 milliwatt hours, okay? At the, this is its nominal uh, capacity of this battery. Because, you know, you can store a lot of energy inside you know, lithium chemistry like this, okay? So with this, let's just assume like 245 milliamp hours. So if we divide 245 uh, milliamp hours divided by um, 87,600, that is uh, 2.8 microamps okay 2.8 microamps so one of the lowest power things ever like this watch is it needs uh two and a half you know it needs in the order of microamps at you know like three volts you know a couple of two to three volts to actually power this thing so <laughs> just come on you need thousands of these things so two volts divided by uh 10 uh micro volts here you need 200 thousand, two hundred thousand of these uh, cylinders to get you to the, you know, two volts operational, minimum operational voltage of something like this watch, right? Which is the lowest power thing that you could, you know, one of the lowest power things you could possibly imagine. But then still, even if you did that, even if you could get the voltage required to power one of these things, you would still only have like 10, 20, you know, in tens of nanoamps um, at that voltage, you still, and like almost an order of magnitude off on the current, just to operate this little piddly watch, right? That you can get one of these tiny little coin cells here to operate for 10 years. And you want to get excited over this? It's ridiculous.
So yeah, everyone, calm down, please. But hats off to the researchers, right? If this is proven to be a, a legit thing, yeah, it's an interesting curiosity from, you know, like a physics uh, point of view. But for a practical, no, this thing will never scale. It is orders and orders and orders of magnitude off from being able to be scaled for anything, even to power a little piss ant watch like this. You've got to be kidding me. Okay, so no, stop getting excited over this. It is an absolute nothing burger. So unfortunately, the only useful thing for a uh, result like this is for the free energy nutters to then reference it um, to sell you their latest snake oil bullshit bloody free energy uh, machine. Look at this, the IEEE Spectral. Look, it's a legit science researcher from Princeton and wherever. And yeah, they've proven that this works. So my free energy bullshit machine has to work. Oh, God. And they'll probably even snip uh, comments from my video or other videos or other um, things going, oh yeah, look, they're proving it. Everyone's talking about this. And oh God, no, stop it. <laughs> yeah, cool. Bit of physics research, but no, a practical nothing burger. Anyway, thoughts and comments down below. Catch you next time.